and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. I'm Laura. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. Today, we're discussing Rodham by Curtis Sittenfeld, a novel that asks what if Hillary Rodham had turned down Bill Clinton's proposal of marriage? This intimate, alternate history has shot onto bestseller lists on both sides of the Atlantic. Explosive, ingenious, fascinating, a wonderful, sad dream of what might have happened are just a few of the many reviewers' quotes. But never mind the reviewers, we're here to find out if it stands up to a book club discussion. Joining us today is journalist Philip Chafee, a previous guest on the show and a regular member of my book club. Phil hails originally from upstate New York, and we're so looking forward to hearing his American perspective on the alternative reality that Sittenfeld explores. We're delighted to have him back again. Welcome, Phil. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Phil, it is very nice to have you in the shed. You're my first podcast guest in the shed post lockdown you wouldn't know this but i hoovered and dusted <laughs> it does look very immaculately clean kate it is the cleanest i think it's well it's definitely the cleanest it's been for months and laura is joining us from her home in east london yeah hey guys and we have been reading rodham <laughs> which we chose because it felt like a bit of a summer buzz book is that fair absolutely yeah i mean it's in the name isn't it the title says it all as does the incredibly smart and marketable hook what if Hillary hadn't married Bill? Yeah. With a great picture of her, too, at least on this edition. I know. Yeah, it is a great cover, actually. It is a cover that would make me pick it up. And yeah. there's something about that portrait of her that is very compelling. So in 1971, as Hillary Rodham graduates from Wellesley College, she delivers a commencement speech that gains national prominence. She then heads to Yale Law School, an intelligent woman filled with a desire to help those in need. And there she meets Bill Clinton, a fellow law student. The connection between the two is instant. For the first time, Hillary feels she has found someone who appreciates her both emotionally and physically. In real life, Hillary and Bill head to Arkansas. He proposes three times and she finally accepts, becoming Hillary Rodham Clinton. But in Curtis Sittenfeld's Rodham, Hillary does not accept Bill's third proposal. Devastated, she leaves Arkansas and embarks on a different life. The pair's paths cross again and again in the years ahead, causing Hillary to sometimes doubt her decision, but it does leave her free to pursue her own political ambitions. It's kind of divided into thirds, isn't it? In the first third, she sticks pretty closely to Hillary's real life. In the middle third, it's the kind of, felt like the doldrum years to me, but yeah. <laughs> where she becomes a senator and she's on her own kind of path to political power. And then the third part is the campaign and running for president. And you don't know throughout the whole book how that's going to turn out. I want to know if we're going to get into spoilers. Yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? I've been thinking a lot about this. We should have discussed this in advance. <laughs> I think we should maybe talk for a while without spoilers, but I think you can't really discuss it without talking about the third part of it. Yeah. But maybe we could give a warning where we're now going to reveal... Okay, yeah, listeners will do it. And is it worth recapping Hillary's real career? I mean, I think we all feel like we know Hillary Clinton. Phil, I'm sure that you have a much better idea than I did about her. But I think even in the UK, she's a really familiar figure. You, you hear her name and you instantly think about the years in the White House. You think of the controversial health care reforms that she tried to push through. You think of what happened with Bill and, and, and her stance over all of that. And then the next thing for me is her as Secretary of State under Obama. Right. Um, she was a senator in between that. Yeah. yeah, which actually I wasn't so aware of. Right. And then the presidential campaign but i just thought is it worth just recapping quickly what she's actually done because yeah. i think it's yes, useful please. to have it at the back of your mind hillary clinton was born in chicago and went on to earn her law degree from yale university she married fellow law school graduate bill clinton in 1975 she later served as first lady from 1993 to 2001 and then as a u.s senator from 2001 to 2009 so that two terms would that be it was Two and a half, basically, because she was reelected in 2006, and then she ran for president, failed against Obama, and then he appointed her to be Secretary of State. Yeah. In early 2007, Clinton announced her plans to run for the presidency. During the 2008 Democratic primaries, she conceded the nomination when it became apparent that Barack Obama held a majority of the delegate vote. 
After winning the national election, Obama appointed Clinton Secretary of State. She was sworn in as part of his cabinet in January 2009 and served until 2013. In the spring of 2015, she announced her plans to run again for the U.S. presidency. In 2016, she became the first woman in U.S. history to become the presidential nominee of a major political party. After a polarizing campaign against Republican candidate Donald Trump, Clinton was defeated in the general election that November. She was defeated, but she wasn't really defeated, was she? It's She's very defeated by winning three million more votes. So, <laughs> And I had a little note that she actually won the most votes of any person who has ever run for president. Is that right? Yeah. Absolutely. Even more really? than Obama. I think so. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Wow. So, you know, we think of her as a failure, but it was an extraordinarily successful campaign on, on some levels. And it has that kind of Brexit yeah. quality here, doesn't it? Of It was so close. I mean, here we were divided by, what, one percentage of the vote? And it's a similar feeling there. You know, she won the actual counted votes, but she lost because of this electoral college system. Right. It's something like 80,000 votes in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Wisconsin, is it? That if they'd gone the other way in those three states, she would have won the electoral college as well. So... It was a crazy election. I've been reading a lot about American politics, and uh, one thing that someone wrote that stuck with me was she should have tried harder in Wisconsin, apparently. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so why does Curtis Sittenfeld come along and write this book? It's an imagined life of Hillary Clinton. What do we think about the subject matter? Well, have you guys read Curtis Sittenfeld much before? I have not. Well, I realize between us, you and me, Laura, actually we have, because I've read Prep, which I loved, which yeah, is her first too. book. I read Sisterland, which I liked but didn't love, which I think was her next. And then you've read her short story collection. And I've also read American Wife. Oh, have you? Yeah. So that was the book previous to this one, which is a novel about Laura Bush. But unlike Rodham, it's fictionalized. It's thoroughly fictionalized, is it not? Well, yes and no. More so than this one. And yet at the same time, I think for all intents and purposes, it is modeled on Laura Bush's life. It's just that they give her a different name and they give George Bush a different name. And I guess when you say, why has she written this novel? In a way, it's kind of what she does. I think she's just attracted to the idea of realizing the interior lives of these people who we will never really know, whose memoirs even are so filtered that they don't give a true portrait of what that person is like. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but it felt to me the character of Hillary in this book was incredibly believable. I felt like that inner voice really rang true. She uses a lot of bits and pieces of actual speeches that Hillary has made, but I think also she invents. And I think she was steeped enough in her character at that point that that always feels fairly truthful to me. I was very convinced by this character of Hillary even at the same time as I found her slightly dull. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like the driving force of the novel was less her than the relationship with Bill Clinton, mm. even though he's there's not a lot of words devoted to him in the second half of the novel, but he's a huge presence. He remains the love of her life. Until he doesn't. Right. <laughs> but it's very much about that relationship. And I think most Americans who were cognizant in the 1990s particularly, spent a lot of time thinking about what are the dynamics of that relationship. Do they hate each other behind closed doors? Do they love each other? What exactly is going on there? Did that give it then this extra frisson for you? Because I agree that's a very compelling element of this story. And I was most interested in the interactions between them and then her thoughts about him subsequently. Yeah, I think as an American, I probably it did add a bit of reason. A bit more of a hook. More of a hook. Also, that's where sort of her attraction to him and their dynamic, because they're both obviously incredibly brilliant people. Mm. They're both at the top of their classes. They're both amazing legal minds and political minds. And they must have some sort of intellectual meeting of the minds. And that I found very believable. I did find some of the other dialogue a bit clunky. And sometimes I was like, this isn't really people talking. This is just sort of progressing the plot a bit. Well, there's quite a lot of thrusting. Can we talk about the sex? <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of sex in this book. And I think there are authors who can write sex well, but I think it's really, really hard to do. And I don't think Sittenfeld nails it. So partly I think the writing isn't really that good. 
And also, when I got to the first intimate passage, she comes at page 54, so 50 pages in. Can I read a little bit or would it be too... Oh, go on. ...inappropriate? And then I could feel the nudging of Bill's erection. It was probably going to happen. Then it was definitely going to happen. He was entering me and I gasped. I gasped both because it felt so incredibly good and because I couldn't believe I was naked with this man. And then he was really inside me. It was happening. And we would eternally from this moment on be two people who'd had sex with each other. Even as he thrust into me, as I arched up against him and gripped his buttocks, there were a few seconds in which our eyes met and we looked at each other, both of us unblinking. <laughs> Neither of us was smiling. Smiling would have been trivial or beside the point. To be with him in this way was an almost <laughs> intolerable ecstasy <laughs> it was the most precious thing i had ever experienced and i was like no ew, no it's like walking into my pants no <laughs> and i never really got over that and i think one of the reasons she might be doing this there's one argument to say you know she's literally sexing it up but there's another to say that one of the accusations that was leveled at hillary one of the kind of misogynistic accusations leveled at her was that she was frigid and i think Sittenfeld then is maybe reinventing her as a living, breathing, sexually active woman and that that's part of her identity, that's part of who she is and on that basis it's valid I think this <laughs> this sort of sexual thread that runs through this book but I never liked it, I was never comfortable when I read it, it always really jolted me out of and then, and then I got you know <laughs> sorry Laura, I know you're not crazy about the Amazon reviews, she doesn't like me but I just, they're so pleasing I just couldn't help but dip in Tomorrow Tea Pits sums it up she says too much information if i didn't know any better i'd swear that bill clinton's erect penis was running for president in this book <laughs> there it was hiding around every corner just waiting to leap out and just after i thought i'd heard the end of it after the first part it came charging back <laughs> there was so much mispotential here very disappointing and i've got one more m h Schatzline calls it celebrity porn. He says it's a difficult premise to get right. The author went the trashy paperback romance route. The first half is a little more than the author detailing in the first person what she imagines it would be like to have sex with Bill Clinton. <laughs> there is a bit more substance as the book progresses, but still intermixed with gratuitous information now about elder sex. Barely worth the read. And it was that word elder sex. I haven't come across that before. I don't know if that's something he's coined or if that's like a known word, but that absolutely sums up what goes on in the second half. She's got host menopause pausal sex with just too much detail about the need for lubricant and, and I was like no oh, Kate you're such a prude am I am I yeah yeah I think you are actually I think you are I didn't even notice the sex I think the fact that she mentioned that a menopausal woman would need lubricant just seemed to me kind of like a feminist statement like something that Rodham would say you know in defiance of I don't know society ignoring that fact mm, or not talking about that yeah I can't believe you say there's too much sex because the poor woman doesn't get to have any sex for years and years later on. Yes, no, no exactly, the doldrums. <laughs> and of course, Bill Clinton is, you know, at best a sex pest, at worst a sex predator. So yeah, it's going to be there. That just felt like the really interesting fictional avenue to explore in a way was this dynamic about this person that we kind of know from his actions and from history. I kind of thought she had fun with that. And that also felt quite convincing to me. I think it was convincing. I also agree with Laura in defending the sex. Yeah. Because going back to sort of American or people thinking about that relationship, frigid was one thing. But another thing was that it was just a marriage of convenience mm. and that they were never actually into each other. And I think that isn't fair to either of them. And you really do need to establish the attraction and then the sex. I would also say, like, if you look at pictures of them from the 70s, it's less squirm-inducing than thinking of, like, the Clintons we know from the past several decades. I think that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's what it is. Because another thing that's interesting is that much is made of, of, of her unattractiveness. Mm. It, it keeps coming up, these references to how she, almost she sees herself. But it's funny, like, the picture of her on the front cover of this book, she's gorgeous. And, yeah. and I never would have thought of her that way she always looked kind of cool I thought those pictures of her in the 70s well I think that actually is more about the fact that she didn't fit into a certain role and yes she wasn't a great great beauty but equally you know the pantsuits right they were always picked on I have never read a book where I burned so hot and so cold within 50 pages of that emotions when it began I actually thought, you know what? I just want Curtis Sittenfeld to tell me the story of Hillary and Bill. I don't need this alternative world where she didn't marry Bill. I want Sittenfeld to set out their relationship in great detail. But then by the time they got to Arkansas, I was just 
bored. I just, I don't know. There was no narrative tension. There was no drive. And then as you said, Kate, there's that third after they break up and then Hillary's planning her run for president sort of 12 years in advance. She's going to be a senator, then she's going to run for president and then it's going to be a failed run, but that's going to prepare the American public for her eventual run in the future when she plans to win. And then I got a bit hooked and I got bored again. Um, it's a funny, funny novel in that way. Your, your Amazon reviewer used the term celebrity porn and I can't quite decide if it's the celebrity aspect that makes it interesting at points or actually gets in the way of the plot Mm. someone asked on goodreads and i kind of picked up on it and i thought is this a worthy question i I don't know if it hadn't been by a well-known author and if it hadn't been about such a well-known public figure would this book have been published but it's not really a helpful question because of course it wouldn't but then it wouldn't exist you know this is the book that she wrote um (laughs) but you kind of see what i mean it's like if it hadn't had that hillary clinton (gasps) you know, hook, would we have cared on on the basis of the novel and how good the actual novel is? And it's interesting when reading lots of people's comments about this book that that's something that comes up as well. You know, it is like a kind of fan fiction, you know, fan fiction where people take an established universe that someone's created and they spin off their own stories where it's like a kind of wish fulfillment about what they'd really like to see happening to the characters. And this does sit slightly uneasily, I think, in that kind of genre because most of the time that genre is just total trash it's not really written by by writers it's written by people who love tv shows and want to immerse themselves in those worlds a bit longer i don't know but you know what i mean there's a kind of it's slightly tarnished by that association i think for me i think you've nailed it fan fiction definitely phil what did you think i think it's fan fiction i think it's also a fantasy of i mean i think the hook for curtis sittenfeld was the 2016 election and it was the first female nominee of a major party being defeated in the Electoral College by one of the most misogynistic men who's ever run for president or been president. And I think it's sort of a fantasy of how could we rerun that in a more satisfying way. And I actually, that first section, Laura, I sort of enjoyed the first half a bit more because you're constantly thinking about her realizing just who Bill Clinton is mm. And not only what a misogynist and sexual assaulter he is, but also just sort of how full of himself he is. And I mean, there's a couple, Gwen says a couple of times, I don't like that guy. Mm. This is one of her friends and mentors. Yeah, who's fictional, but who's sort of based on a real person. But yeah, I, I thought that that first bit, and also I, I maybe even my favorite part was the middle section, where you're really contemplating her coming to terms with his misogyny and on what that's about, I, I just found super compelling. Is this the point to talk about the ending? Yeah. Well, I think we have to talk a little bit more about the campaign because one of the weird things is in real life, we had this extraordinary drama, didn't we, between the first woman nominee for president, the potential to have the first female president of the United States and all of the hopes and the aspirations that were behind that. And then you had Donald Trump, who was conducting a ruthless, brutal campaign of appealing to the lowest common denominator, scare tactics, It's just total real-life drama. And in Sittenfeld's novel, you don't get any of that. Weirdly, the main opponent is actually Bill. And then you never really hear about the Republican opponent. I can't even think who it is. It's Jeb Bush, she she says. Yeah, he's mentioned in passing. In a way, but just coming back to, like, this whole premise is it's an alternative world. And so it would be boring to hear about a race against Jeb Bush because it's too far removed from actual life. It's much more interesting to have her race against bill clinton and for trump then to show up bizarrely as her supporter there it almost descends into farce isn't the right word but he's such a distraction isn't he yeah i mean the trump cameos are good they make you smile well not really they kind of make you wince but they're they're absolutely spot on yeah she gets his syntax on everything yeah or lack thereof and so bizarrely in this world he decides that he doesn't support bill um which again felt very strange um, and hard to swallow that he would have made this choice. But so in, in this world, he decides that actually he's going to get behind Hillary. No, I totally got that though, Kate. Well, I can't remember what his reasoning was. I think it's purely ego is that Bill is like another alpha male and there's no way he's going to endorse him. Yeah, maybe. Right. But it still just felt like too much of a stretch to me that Donald Trump would support a woman. Basically, she sets it up. So Bill is sort of the Donald Trump. Mm, mm. Um, and Bill is 
flirting with populism and Bill's campaign rallies, there's people chanting with him egging them on saying, shut her up. Whereas Trump rallies had people saying, lock her up. Mm. But it's basically the same thing. And as far as I can tell, the reason Trump himself is not running as a Republican is because he's edged out by Bill and Bill's filling this populist void. Yeah. But then she's able to beat Bill. Do you really believe that Democratic primary voters would be doing the shutter up stuff at Bill Clinton rallies? I'm not sure. Ooh, good point. I feel like at this point, there's a whole bunch of alternate worlds starting with 1992. She has at the beginning of Section 3, who's the president in the interceding years between 92 and mm, 2016. Mm. And just thinking through that, I feel like derails <laughs> derailed me because as a, you're like a political junkie, you're just like, wait, how would that have happened? And where the hell was George W. Bush? And apparently there's no 9-11 or Iraq war or there's all these big questions and she just sort of skirts over them because she's not concerned with them. But, yeah. Um, and there's too long a span, I thought. It covers too wide a period of time and she can't sustain the intensity. She has to skate over all that stuff, which is why the middle section, I think, feels quite boring. Because, you know, we're not, we're not going to go into that. We won't do that. We'll just, ugh. you know, so all you get is her sort of inner thoughts about how she's developing policy and having these encounters with people and how that affects her as a person. But you don't really see that much of the bigger picture at all. It's just not really in there until you then start to pin things down a bit more specifically again when you get to this imagined presidential race at the end. I was going to say this idea of her as a female candidate and what that meant. There is a paragraph where she sets out that message that when I read it, I thought, that's the heart of this book. That's what this book Did is about. Did you have goosebumps? Call me a sucker, but I definitely had moments where I had goosebumps. And I know that's what Curtis Sittenfeld was aiming for. I could feel myself being a bit manipulated, but nonetheless. Like, what gave you goosebumps? Nothing. I can't even think of what that might be. <laughs> Maybe it's because, you know, you're not a woman, Phil. You just, you know... <laughs> no, I agree. I think you're right, Laura. I think that there is this thing about there's a wonderful which came from a real speech where she talks about seeing the glass ceiling as a field and the way that gradually women are crossing this field and, and you know, we will get there kind of thing. And in this passage, she talks about I've been asked countless times why I was running for president and I would answered countless times seemingly never to anyone's satisfaction. I think the problem was that journalists and voters were asking an individual question that had a collective answer. I did want to help people, and I wanted to help as many people as possible. I did like the work of holding elected office, and I liked doing things I was good at, and I liked being recognized for doing things that I was good at. But as much as I wanted to be president, I wanted a woman to be president. I wanted this because women and girls were half the population, and we deserved, as a basic human right and a means of ensuring justice, to be equally represented in our government. Yet it was hard to explain because no man had ever run for president for this reason. Even Barack, who'd surely run in part for the racial version of it, had never, to my knowledge, articulated it as such. Some presidents cared about improving the world, and all of them had egos, but none of them had run because they hoped to gain entry to the highest office of power on behalf of an entire gender. Yes, I was me, Hillary, but I was also a vessel and a proxy. And I kind of read that and was like, wow, yeah. But the weird thing about that to me is that it's kind of strange because growing up here in the UK, you know, I grew up under Thatcher. You know, we had this incredibly charismatic, powerful, visible, you know, for good or bad, you know, but we had this really strong woman prime minister for a long time, like eight years, 10 years, I think. And then since her, we've had Theresa May. And so it doesn't seem weird to me that we would have a female prime minister that doesn't seem strange at all. And so it, one of the things that kind of struck me about this was the way that that's still so important in America. That hasn't happened there. And why hasn't it happened there? You know, how odd is that? And it does feel overdue. And I think as an argument for why that should have happened, this book is really persuasive and it's powerful and it makes you really reflect on that. Yeah, I think I agree. The passages that got to me were a bit more on the nose this is just a bit where one of her wealthy donors who's a woman is talking about why she's going to sponsor hillary and she says i want a woman in that seat whether it's alan dixon or joe biden or george bush i'm so tired of these idiot men getting to make up the rules for the rest of us they're not smarter they're not nicer they don't have better judgment they're just men mm. But of course, Kate, just being really a, a bit pedantic, Margaret Thatcher wasn't elected by the general population of the UK. She became leader of the party. Prime ministers aren't elected in that way. The president of the United States is voted 
in by the public. They choose that president. Right. They're filling out that name on the ballot, which is a, a difference. I would say another big thing is the female leaders you can think of globally have traditionally been either right wing or dynastic. So from their their husband was president or their Mm. father was or whatever. So Benazir Bhutto or Indira Gandhi Mm. or right wing Angela Merkel or Theresa May. And we're now seeing in New Zealand and Finland, there are left wing female leaders finally making it to office. But I think that's a harder mold to break. Mm. Um, And why the Republicans haven't had a female leader, I don't know. But I do think it's a different glass ceiling. It's not just being the leader. Yeah. I mean, I think that is a fascinating question. And I kind of like the way that she explores that. So then, yes, to come on to this ending, you know, in the last 10 pages, you get this amazing moment where you realize that she's won the election. She is in the White House and she's just reflecting on what it took to get her there and what she now might do with that position and that feels great, that bit. You're like, oh. I was really I was really surprised. I thought it was going to get really dark. <laughs> That's funny. Well, In what I way? Had, I had a sinking feeling that Trump was going to throw himself into the ring as the Republican candidate, and then he would win, and we'd just be back where we are now. No, no one wants to read that story. <laughs> I should have kept that in mind. <laughs> just one more defense of the middle section. Mm-hmm. Because the middle section is where the alternate history really diverges Mm. on the sort of U.S. level. Do you think you have to appreciate more about American politics to really appreciate the middle section of this book? (laughs) Possibly. I mean, there is a long section of her and her sort of office politics, which I I grant is a bit tedious. (laughs) But what Sittenfeld seems to posit is that what was the most pivotal thing was in the 1992 Democratic primary, in both reality and in this book, Bill Clinton runs and there's this sex scandal with Jennifer Flowers, mm-hmm. who's this woman he had an affair with for several years while governor of Arkansas. Mm. In real life, Hillary Clinton sat down for the 60 Minutes interview, which was very famous. And she said, I'm no Tammy Wynette, stand by your man woman, but I support Bill and we're getting over this. This is just a rough patch. She doesn't cry. And in the novel... After Hillary breaks up with him, Bill finds someone who the application is is a bit less intellectually at his level. Yeah, someone quite insipid. (laughs) Who then cries in this interview, and that is a defining moment where then he has to withdraw from the race. And that's where the national politics departs. Mm. So she posits that as the most important thing that Hillary did in real life. Yeah, but her support, her visible support an unwavering support at that moment meant that actually people transferred their anger and frustration against him onto her a little bit, did they not? Absolutely. That was sort of what happened. And she also went into the White House then. I mean, they sort of ran saying you get two for one. Mm. And she went into the White House and was given health care policy. And they talked about Hillary care for 15 years before Obamacare came along. And that all led up to this massive wipeout in the midterms in 1994, at which point she had to retool and go on cooking shows and do a much more traditional first lady thing. So that's why I thought that middle section, one of the joys of reading this novel is you're constantly comparing it to reality Mm. and tracking like, well, how are things different and why are they different? The Hillary Clinton as first lady is one of the most interesting parts of her career, I think, Mm. because that's where she's really trying to do something new. And then there's this massive backlash and a huge part of the anti-Clinton animus was her coming in trying to lead on policy. I remember that. Yeah, Yeah. that's what I remember. I watched that interview today, or at least a bit of it, and she was amazing. Hillary in the original 60 Minutes. I mean, she's a woman of great substance, isn't she? And I suppose in a way, I think one of the other things that I found frustrating about this book was that actually, for me, I felt like this diminished her. I think the real Hillary is extraordinary and her life has been extraordinary. And I didn't really feel like this did that justice. It paled in comparison to, I had already read, I hadn't finished it, but I had read what happened, which is her account of the election defeat. Because at the time I was like, oh, wow, I want to know the behind the scenes of this story. And she's a good writer and her story is incredibly compelling and interesting. And as an individual, she's incredibly multifaceted and nuanced and interesting and all that comes across. And I didn't really get that from this. I felt like this was somehow less 
than the reality and I thought the story was less interesting than the reality and so ultimately I was just left questioning why she would bothered for me it wasn't really enough which is a shame because I think it's heart is in the right place I don't want to dislike it I feel a bit mean but <laughs> that was my experience reading it that's just how I felt hey I think you summed it up I think I agree with that I have nothing to add when has that ever happened before <laughs> but I feel like maybe you liked it more than I did or... I liked bits of it and I did pick up on exactly what Phil was saying about that moment of departure on the 60 Minutes interview and then when I finished it I was googling a few people to see if they were real people or fictionalized people and small details that Americans would probably pick up that I didn't. One of those people was Carol Mosley Brown who is running for the Democratic primary to be the Illinois senator and she, in real life, actually did become the first African-American woman senator in 92, 93, whenever it was. Whereas in this world, because Hillary decides that she's going to run, she then supplants Mosley Brown. So little twists like that. But it kind of felt like you had to be in the know to really get it. One big criticism I would have is she's very uninterested in actual politics and policy and sort of any of the things they want to do. And therefore, you miss a huge dynamic of the Clintons, who were sort of the new Democrats, just like Blair was new yeah, Labour. And yeah. you miss this whole, and you know, she doesn't really deal with, well, no. what, what about Bernie Sanders in yeah. 2016? There's a lot of stuff where <laughs> she's just not that interested. She's interested in the first female president and the gender dynamics, but the other stuff, yeah. It made me think slightly nostalgically about the TV series The West Wing. <laughs> That was wish fulfillment, mm. you know, politics. My God, you'd sit down and you'd watch an episode of The West Wing and you'd sit up at the end of it and you'd be like, my God, we must do something about this. This is <laughs> so important. And why do people not talk about like the, the census more or, you know, whatever, thinking about some random things that they used to explore in that show. What I think Aaron Sorkin was very good at was making politics interesting and making it relevant to you through the characters. And she doesn't do any of that. Mm. She really doesn't. And I wanted that because that interests me and that's what I kind of enjoy. And, and this didn't really have any of that. So it fell a little bit flat. We are having an excellent discussion, though. Oh, I see where this is going. <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> Segway. <laughs> Was it a good book club book? Yeah, I don't know. It's tricky. Oh, come on. When you only have three. Well, it, you have to say it is. There's so much to discuss here. <sighs> it's so boring to read, though. I wouldn't want to inflict it on my book club. But I've been telling other people to read it Have just you? so I can discuss it. Yeah, because I just think it's a fun... That's it. Again, I think it's quite mean, given how much they're going to have to wade through <laughs> just to then have an informed debate with you at the end of it. <laughs> I'd get them to read the first third and the last 10 pages. <laughs> but yeah. So what are we saying then? A good book club book. I'm with Phil. I mean, Kate, even you sent us a text saying how much you wanted to discuss it when you'd finished it. It was my suggestion. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, it was my suggestion that we read it. I was certainly very intrigued by it. And yeah, well, I was just so curious to know what you guys would have made of it. I, you know, it's that kind of classic thing, isn't it? I knew what I thought. I had no sense of what either of you might have made of it. I mean, in a way, I feel like there's kind of broadly been a consensus, hasn't there? Yeah, I, I agreed with Maybe you. Maybe with me slightly more on the negative scale. But yeah, we're all saying it was basically worthwhile. It's an interesting subject. She's a good enough writer that she does it really well. But it was kind of flawed. For the various reasons yeah, we I think discussed. we all liked and disliked slightly different parts, but <laughs> yeah, I don't think any of us loved it, right? Mm. I would, what I would say is it's definitely not a beach read. No, because if you had a cocktail in the first third, there's no way you'd stay <laughs> you away. Just chuck it in the pool. <laughs> Part two. <laughs> and I just say that because it's kind of the hot summer read, or at least that's what we're being led it's to being believe. As and that. it's really, yeah. really dull. Yeah. It's not my hot summer read. <laughs> <laughs> Inspired by Rodham, here are some recommendations for your next book club read. Laura, what have you got? Yeah, well, I've already name dropped this book. It is American Wife by Curtis Sittenfeld, and it was her third novel. And it is, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, a fictional memoir by a 21st century first lady who is very much Laura Bush, although. She is given a different name and her husband who becomes president over the course of the novel is also given a different name. That's where the differences really end. In, in every other aspect, they are Laura and W. 
It is a great book. My book club actually read it. Oh. Pre-podcast days, a long time ago, even maybe before I moved back to Canada about 10 years ago. I had a year back in Canada. So ages ago, eons ago. But it was a fantastic discussion. It's a surprising book because, of course, I think most of the people reading it would not feel inclined to be sympathetic to Laura Bush. George W. Bush being such a... Hawk? <laughs> yes, that's one way to put it. I was going to say unsavory <laughs> character, but yes, a hawk as well. You know, a deeply, deeply flawed and malign influence on international affairs. Where actually his wife, Laura, was very different. And it's such an interesting counterpart to this novel. Because in a way, when Hillary Rodham talks about, I'm not like Tammy Wynette standing by my man. That's actually what Laura Bush is like that. Didn't she wrestle him back from the brink of alcoholism yeah and that that then enabled him to go on and run for president yeah and he was a wild child you know he was never meant to be president i think actually there's a little dig in rod him you know where it's jed bush running he was supposed to be jed mm. bush you know and that dynastic follow-through and somehow it ended up being george so in many ways it's a more subtle book because it's actually telling the story of a woman who for all intents and purposes has no public persona or rather she's a cipher she just stands next to george w bush and smiles and looks friendly you know if hillary had health care laura bush who was a librarian oh was she a librarian mm. her platform is all about literacy so it's just very soft and gentle and yet of course of course she has her own inner life and story and her own perspective on what's happening and who her husband is so yeah actually probably better than Rodham. I'm saying probably only because I read it ages ago, but I do remember my book club loving it and we had a great discussion. Yeah, and it certainly seems everything I've read about it that that was the sort of word of mouth sleeper hit. People who've read it seem to sort of rave about it in a way that I wouldn't think they would be about Rodham. So yeah, that sounds great. I want to try that one. I wanted to flag up something we've talked about a couple of times, I think, on the show, which is Michelle Obama's memoir, Becoming. We talked about that on episode 46, which is one of our bookshelf shows, but then Laura read it too. This is Michelle Obama's memoir of her life, beginning right back with her childhood, growing up in a poor black neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, and then her early years, and then ending up with her years in the White House as First Lady. It's a really well-balanced memoir. It's quite a sort of slow burn, but then when you get to the White House, I really appreciated the time she had taken over her childhood years and the things that had gone into making her the kind of person that she was. All that felt really important. And in comparison to Rodham, it's a really interesting story about someone navigating the complexities of her role in the White House. You know, like Hillary, she's a lawyer, super bright, super capable, every bit her husband's partner. And how then could she carve out a role for herself where she was able to do things and influence things in, in her own ways without being stigmatized and pilloried? I mean, I think she had to have learned in a way from Hillary's missteps, arguably, although she doesn't talk about that, she doesn't mention that, but thinking about it, of course she would have been aware of that history. And it's just a really good read. If you listen to the audiobook, she narrates it. She reads it quite slowly. So as it's quite a long book, <laughs> my tip there is that you can speed her up to 1.5 speed and that's good. And I also wanted to flag up Something Happened, which was Hillary's own memoir, which is riveting. It's a really good read and she writes really, really well and I think she's worth it. It's worth reading in her own words the story of what happened and and deciding for yourself what you think about her. It's a good book and I think you could have a good discussion afterwards. And just one tiny thing I wanted to flag up as well was um, just an essay by David Foster Wallace. If you've never read David Foster Wallace, uh, Infinite Jest is his kind of uh, masterwork that few people have ever finished. It's funny, people kind of feel worse about not having finished Infinite Jest, I think, than they do about not having read Proust or War and Peace. Phil, did you, have you made it through Infinite Jest? I have not. I've only read Consider the Lobster. Ah, so, so there you go. Yeah. So, but if you, you, you know, you want to try this writer and he's a really important writer. He's a really interesting writer. He has these essay collections of which one is Consider the Lobster. And there is an essay in that which is about his time following John McCain in the 2000 presidential campaign, where he spent a week embedded with the press writing on behalf of Rolling Stone magazine. One of the kind of running jokes about the article is that Rolling Stone wanted like, you know, a five page piece and he turns in something like 50,000 words <laughs> you know with extensive footnotes at the end but it feels like the political side of it maybe 
is slightly more complicated. I think he was sort of a conservative with a small C. I've read about him. The nuances of the politics maybe were slightly lost on me. But what I love about that essay is just the brilliant portrait of what it's like on the campaign trail, you know, what it's like for the candidates, what it's like for the journalists that follow them, you know, in the media circus that surrounds the whole thing. And, and, and he just brings that to life absolutely brilliantly. And as an introduction to him, these essays are just a really great starting point. So I recommend those. Phil, how about you? I have two. One actually is a nice compliment to that one, oh. which is Political Fictions, which is a series of essays by Joan Didion. Oh. Um, it's, it's a lot longer. It's from, she was commissioned by um, Robert Silvers, who is the editor of the New York Review of Books in 1988 to sort of be their correspondent on the campaign trail. And then she did it in 88, again in 1992 and 94. Some of it is about the Clinton Lewinsky scandal. And then I think it goes up through 2000. So it's the same campaign that David Foster Wallace was on, but with a very, very different perspective. And yeah, how interesting to compare them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm much more partial to Joan Didion, who's mm. one of my favorite writers mm. ever. But No, um, I love her too. Yeah. And I mean, this is this is actually where I, I started with Joan Didion bef here before I'd ever read The White Album or Your Magical Thinking. And I just think it's an interesting take. It's much less about sort of... Uh, politics then it's a meta look at sort of looking how the press is interacting with the politics mm. and she has her unique definitely conservative LOC um take on everything but uh, it's a it's a great read and she's obviously an amazing writer mm. the other book i would recommend is game change which is not nearly as good writing but this is about the 2008 campaign the presidential campaign it's by mark halperin and john heilman and basically they were just campaign reporters. I think one was for Time or Newsweek. I forget exactly. But they were given this access to sort of all of the campaigns. So this is the Clinton-Obama and then Obama-McCain. And they were given this access, but a lot of this stuff they weren't allowed to use before the election. So mm. they were given better access, therefore. And this book is divided into three parts. The first part's the Democratic primary, then the Republican primary, and then the general election. The third part of that, HBO did a little mini series where they focused in on the John McCain campaign. And that's where you had um, Woody Harrelson playing John McCain. You also have Sarah Palin then. So all these characters from 2008. But I that is a really, it's a page turner. And it's not particularly insightful, but it's just behind the scenes. How are these campaigns operating? All of the operatives and the characters and going state to state. And it's just, it's really fun. Mm. Um, so if you, if you like the politics, it's not at all interested in the policy. It's a fun one. Great. Well, thanks for those. And uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. That's all for this episode. Our book recommendations were American Wife by Curtis Sittenfeld, Becoming by Michelle Obama, what Happened by Hillary Rodham Clinton, the essay Up Simba, which features in the collection Consider the Lobster by David Foster Wallace, Political Fictions by Joan Didion, and Game Change, Obama and the Clintons, McCain and Palin, and The Race of a Lifetime by Mark Heileman and John Halperin. And you can find all those plus links in our show notes. We'll be back in September with shows on Booker Prize winner Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Evaristo, another must-read of the summer, The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett, and feel-good non-fiction Humankind, A Hopeful History by Rutger Bregman. And if you're planning what to pile by your deck chair, whether you actually make it to a beach or just have to make do with the garden, don't miss our summer reading guide out now. We've put together a list of tried and tested books with the aim of giving you the perfect options to suit whatever mood you find yourself in this summer. If you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or email the Book Club Review at gmail.com. And if you like what we do, please take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. It helps other listeners find us and means you'll never miss an episode. But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>